What is up, my cutouts cardboard ninja here coming at you with another tier list, this time on the docket, co-drivers. This is going to look a little bit different for uh, some of you. This is not your traditional S to D tier list. This is an alignment chart. This is an alignment chart because co-drivers are a little bit more persnickety than weapons or uh, cabins. And so because they have both a active ability as well as a set of perks, those need to be rated slightly differently. The horizontal line here is going to represent how often a co-driver's active ability is going to be working for you and about how well it's going to work for you. And the vertical line here represents how much value you get from a co-driver's passive abilities. The resulting position on this XY axis is the sum value you get for a particular co-driver. In summary, the higher on this vertical axis, the better, and the farther to the right on the horizontal axis, the better. To further explain, an active ability of the highest frequency is not only available every single match played, but also effectively every single minute during those matches. So that would be something all the way on the far right. An active ability of the lowest frequency, one that's far on the left, would be one that you that typically doesn't not only doesn't come up in a match, but also you might not see across multiple matches. A high passive value set of perks is one where the perks synergize well with themselves and or the co-driver's active ability and thus dramatically improve the build, whereas a low passive value set of perks is where the perks either don't synergize well with the perk set itself and or the co-driver's active ability or provide bonuses that are particularly irrelevant. Without further ado, let's kick things off with our first co-driver, Yuki. Yuki's active ability has eight charges, and the perk activates on four charges. You gain one charge a second for each enemy facing away from Yuki within 35 meters. While active, all damage Yuki deals is increased by 15%. Yuki's passive perks are 5% additional cabin tonnage, minus 20% to all slowing effects, and plus 10% movement part durability. So, some particulars about Yuki. Yuki is one of two co-drivers who have an always-on active perk. What this means is that there is no break between the perk if played perfectly. You can, once activated, you can just simply drive behind multiple enemies, and the perk will stay on basically for the entire match, provided you're able to maintain that 35 meter distance to the rear of enemies. Additionally, Yuki's perk will last four seconds if you uh, disengage from an enemy after it activates because it, you lose one uh, charge per second. But the interesting thing is it goes up to eight charges. It activates on four. So that means that you can have actually up to eight seconds of her perk while not actually uh, meeting the prerequisites to gain charges on the perk. Nothing can make you drop charges other than the fact that, that you aren't behind your opponents. The cone behind your opponents is actually very lenient. Um, it appears that basically any place behind the midway point of an opponent's cabin counts to trigger this perk. So it is actually kind of generous in order to generate perks, uh, generate perk charges with Yuki. All that being said though, it is actually somewhat difficult to guarantee that you activate her perk because the fact that you have to be within 35 meters of your opponent, which is actually a very short distance away, people are going to easily be able to notice you, uh, even in cloak, it's going to be rough because as anyone who's ever played Crossout knows, if you end up shooting someone, they're going to immediately turn and shoot you back. Specifically, the thing that matters here is turn, which can get to get you to deactivate Yuki's 15% damage perk. Additionally, Yuki's uh, passive perks, passive skills, not very uh, good because not every enemy comes with slowing effects. This will defend you against the Jiboku, this will defend you against the Flash and the Spark, but those are three weapons out of 160 plus at this point, so that's not really going to matter that much. The 5% additional cabin tonnage is nice, uh, but not necessary. This simply means that you need less wheels or uh, a weaker engine in order to have enough tonnage or active tonnage to move your vehicle, but in reality, you're gonna most likely build around, uh, not have to build around that anyway. 10% more movement part durability is somewhat of an afterthought. Um, the parts, I've said this before in many other um, situations, but the parts that most benefit from 10% uh, durability are tracks, and you will not, most certainly not be using tracks uh, with Yuki, and the parts that would benefit the most from gaining hit points don't gain as much with only a 10% increase. So not that very strong showing of passive perks. Uh, that all said, where would I rate Yuki? Surprisingly enough, I would rate Yuki exactly in the dead middle. 
of this tier list. Yuki's perk is available when you uh, can get it to it. It isn't something that your opponent can control. If with perfect play, you can keep it up. It's going to be available more or less, maybe once or twice per match you play. Um, unfortunately, like the Lancer play style and things like that, play against Yuki because you're not going to be able to be behind them long enough to, to trigger the perk to activate to get give to you bonus damage on your lances. But this is, Yuki is very strong for melee builds who are attempting to attack people and dog them from behind and things like that. It changes the way that you have to play the game. You have to focus primarily on obviously sticking behind your opponent attacking them in the rear to get that perk active and her uh, passive perks do help you especially melee players who are afraid of slowing effects ruining their day but other than that uh yeah yuki basically lands i believe dead center of this list next up on this tier list we have jay jay's active ability has four charges which trigger on hit from 80 meters or farther with a three second delay these charges degrade over time approximately you lose one charge every 10 seconds and for every charge you have your damage is increased by seven percent which maxes out at 28 percent with four charges hits under 80 meters however immediately will turn off this perk it will you will get the bonus damage so assuming you have four charges you'll have 28 percent and someone rushes you and you shoot them You'll get your 28% damage on that one shot, but will immediately drop that perk. Uh, we'll consider that a missed shot, and your charges will instantaneously drop to zero. Jay's passive abilities are 5% projectile speed, minus 10% weapon spread, and minus 20% weight to ammo crates. So Jay is the second co-driver, similar to Yuki, with a perk that is potentially always on. If you land every single one of your shots and you do it before that you have 10 seconds between each volley to do so you can actually keep her perk up for the entire round provided you're able to land each and every single one of your shots and each and every single one of your shots are over 80 meters mind you you lose every single uh stack if you miss all of the projectiles in any particular volley additionally the limitation of three seconds between each perk uh stack that you can gain kind of precludes this perk from being used with something such as machine guns, which is pretty brutal because of the fact that if you were to using tap fire machine guns or if you're using mini guns or anything other than, let's say, cannons, uh, you risk losing your perk altogether in rapid order. Jay is obviously a sniper uh, and favors sniper play, play styles. Scorpions, obviously, uh, typhoons, tsunamis, uh, the Astraeus, crossbows, things like that. In order to make use of that 5% additional projectile velocity, uh, the minus 10% spread is, of course, always good. It means that your weapons are more accurate, and almost every single one of these weapons, with the exception of, say, the Astraeus, does use ammo crates, and that will help that out. The ammo weight, though, isn't that important. Um, you're not going to be getting very much mass off of a minus 20% ammunition crate weight because the majority of people who play Clan Wars and things like that only bring one fused ammo crate anyway, so you're only going to be saving a very 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 small amount of mass with that perk so her passive values aren't very strong though they do synergize well with her active perk which is you know getting more damage down range she also has the highest damage bonus of any co-driver at 28 percent potentially so she's got that going for her jay is actually very difficult to rank on any list only because of the fact that jay could be the most powerful co-driver or not depending on whether or not you're the best player in the game so if you are the absolute best player across out in the entire game jay is your co-driver especially if you're someone who plays sniper weapons simply because you will be able to do plus 28 percent damage for the entire game assuming that you land every single shot for us mere mortals however it needs to be noted that the first shot that you actually land on your opponent gives you a charge to your perk but it does no does nothing it gives you no bonus damage it is as though you have no perk at all if you miss your second shot it sets you back to no perk and then you have to land your third shot which will then do nothing for you until you land another subsequent shot so her perk is available often but not as often as you'd think depending on how good or bad you the player are so her uh her passive abilities attempt to mitigate this by giving you additional accuracy and projectile speed, but in reality what it comes down to with Jay is you have to be the very best there ever was in order to unleash her true potential. And with her true potential unlocked, you are an unbelievable nightmare on the battlefield. 
So where does Jay uh, rank on this list? That's going to be interesting because with the counterplay available, with the fact that not all maps have access to 80 meters plus lines of sight, though there are a couple that do, the fact that if you miss your shots, it resets, the fact that if you land your shots, but they're too close, it resets, that means that her perk will be available in the majority of the games that you play. But even if it's available to activate in the majority of the games that you play, it doesn't mean that you won't, you'll necessarily have the ability to actually have it. Her perks do have value. Uh, and they do feed into themselves, so I'm going to say she lands right about here. Next up on the list we have R-Type 52, the Droner of the bunch. He provides basically pure bonuses to drones. His perk has 12 charges. You will gain 3 per second while within 60 meters of non-flying drones that you control, or you gain 4, a second, uh, four charges a second while within 60 meters of turrets you control. This means that you can fully charge his perk within either 5 seconds or 3 seconds respectively. While his perk is active, you gain plus 20% damage to all of your turrets and drones that are within 35 meters of yourself. R-Type 52's passives are 10% more drone durability, 20% more drone activation time, that means how long they are out in the battlefield, and minus 10% drone delay. If you launch your drones, there's a moment before they actually start activating and fighting. This cuts 10% off of that. There are a lot of interesting foibles uh, with R-Type 52 because flying drones are affected by the activation of the perk, but do not contribute to the activation of the perk. So that means that any pure flying drone build, you're actually running perkless. R-Type 52 will actually do no active abilities for you. Though the drone durability, the activation time, and drone delay will uh, all be affected. Your, like, affecting your flying drones. In order to actually get his active ability, you need a turret or you need a drone. Other things of note, you only need one turret or drone to activate his ability at top speed. It doesn't matter how many turrets and or drones you are near, only the one of highest value will count. So for example, if you are two annihilator drones, those are hover drones, and one DC uh, anaconda turret, believe it or not, that turret will get you to your perk immediately in a span of three seconds. So that does allow for some interesting play there. Ultimately, R-Type 52 is the quintessential drone uh, co-driver and seeks to be, and actually with the passive abilities that he totes, he more or less is. I'm saying he, but he's a robot. It more or less is. The problem is the active ability. The, the most powerful drones in the game are Annihilator drones, by far. Uh, but he can't really activate those to any meaningful effect. The most powerful wheel drones are arguably fuses. Uh, the fuse drone is of course cancer to everyone and everyone hates them, as do I, but, uh, and the passive perks again on our type buff those to the moon, but in reality most people launch those drones and let them just drive off into the wild blue yonder and detonate for the lulls off in the distance. The thing is, in order to get that bonus 20% damage you have to be within 35 meters, which is very close as stated before on this tier list. Um, which most people aren't. So you actually don't get the benefit of the of R-Type 52's active perk with the uh, most powerful of the drones and turrets that are available in the game, which is counter to what you'd expect from a co-driver. For example, Jay works with scorpions, you know, things like that. So that actually hurts R-Type in a way that is wholly unique to itself. So with that said, where does R-Type land on this tier list? His passive values are golden, they are beyond the beyond, uh, mint condition, absolutely perfect, and are absolutely the highest. However, unfortunately, his perk doesn't always work when you would want it to, and it's not uh, available on the most powerful drone types in the entire game, so we're going to actually have to bring him down just a little bit on the perk frequency. Strong uh, co-driver, obviously the quintessential co-driver for the drones, but his active ability is not as active as it needs to be. Next up on the tier list, we're going to go to Billy. Billy is the quintessential tap fire machine gun legend god. Billy has a perk that has 30 charges. You gain one charge a hit at 30 meters. However, the charge that you gain on Billy has a 0.2 something second delay. So in reality, in order to charge up his perk at the absolute fastest pace, you need to stagger fire machine guns in order to achieve that. 
Uh, while this perk is active, it increases all damage dealt by you and received by you for six seconds or until you lose any weapon. His perk has an additional addendum that says that the bonus damage that you gain does not affect drones or turrets. Billy's passive perks are minus 10% spread rate increase. That is how uh, much your weapon bloom increases as you hold down the trigger on rapid fire weapons. Plus 10% rotation speed and plus 5% self-destruct damage. There's a lot to say about Billy because his particulars make him an odd duck to be sure. Um, Billy's perk has decent frequency. His active ability is decent frequency. You almost certainly, as long as you're using tap fire machine guns, be able to activate his um, ability at least once around, which is good. Um, but the downside is that it comes with some rather unique penalties. Taking additional 25% damage is very, 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 very bad. And typically, um, that shouldn't be that big a problem, but it actually is. It's actually a massive problem. Uh, the reason why it's a massive problem is because anyone who knows anything about tap fire machine guns in particular knows tap fire machine guns don't have very many hit points. Sinus O's are your quintessential S tier tap fire machine gun and barely have 100 something hit points. Uh, taking 25% more damage on a Sinus O means your opponents could strip you immediately. Mind you, having your perk dis uh, deactivate after they remove one of your guns so that your other guns may survive a little bit longer is neat. Uh, that kind of defeats the purpose of shooting someone 30 times to activate the perk in the first place. 25% um, bonus damage is neat. Uh, it does not stack very well with the Punisher's 100% bonus damage, only because of the fact that the Punisher's activate before the uh, Billy perk, and you have to miss shots intentionally trying to synergize that activation at the same time. Though, if you do ever manage to get the uh, Punisher's to activate at the same time as the Billy perk, good on you. You're going to do a lot of bonus damage. It's going to remarkably shrek your opponent and thankfully punishers have enough hit points that that bonus damage that you're taking most likely isn't going to make that big of a difference to them reaching your guns as your punishers should be relatively protected anyway billy's passive abilities are actually somewhat a mix and match jumble of what uh, if you get to what you get um spread rate when firing is good because for tap fire machine guns, it means that you maintain accuracy longer, thumbs up. But the thing is, 10% rotation speed is almost completely irrelevant for tap fire machine guns, uh, which means that the rotation speed is good for miniguns. So, for example, the Miller or the Reaper or even Arbiters and the uh, Equalizers. The problem is that the 10% spread rate is completely useless on those. And the reason why is because you're going to reach maximum spread in seconds anyway, so that actually does nothing. And 5% more self-destruct damage is in, its, in and of itself a non-starter. So where exactly does that, is that going to put Billy on this list? Well, his passives bring him down, actually. He's not actually as high up as one would expect because the passives either don't synergize well with each other because you aren't really ever going to use any combination of those at the same time, combined with a worthless uh, a perk. It just really hurts him. As for his active ability, however, you're able to control that. You really are. Uh, and as long as you're able to move yourself appropriately, not take damage, and deal out additional damage, 25% damage for 6 seconds can be remarkably useful. Uh, mind you, uh, please note that you will probably want to stagger fire machine guns in order to get to that perk at the fastest rate. But that said, you will be receiving 25% bonus damage when he comes back, but you will be able to activate this most, more or less every single game that you ever play, multiple times per match, most likely. If you're wondering who Cardboard Ninja's favorite co-driver is, it is this very next one. It is Phobos. Phobos has an interesting perk that has five charges. You gain three charges per second while within 30 meters of any enemy. Uh, multiple enemies do not increase the number of charges you get. However, charges are blocked, gaining charges is blocked, for four seconds if you take any damage at all. Uh, when active, the perk gives you plus 25% bonus damage for five seconds. Phobos's passive abilities are invisibility detection range minus 10%, invisibility module cooldown plus 10%, and plus five kilometers an hour to your cabin's top speed. Some particulars about Phobos's active ability if you take damage after it has become active, you will still gain your 25% bonus damage for the full duration of its perk. It's just that you won't gain charges back after that time until four seconds have elapsed since the last time you've taken damage. 
As a whole, Phobos is somewhat of a problematic co-driver only because of the fact that while his perks, his passive perks, do improve the likelihood of you being able to achieve his active perk, and his active perk being a flat damage bonus to any and all weapons that you have, the issue is that he can be shut down. If people simply are firing at you while you're invisible, or shutting down lanes with machine guns, or if there's fire puddles, or if you accidentally crash into someone while invisible, all of those things will end up nerfing your perk, and there can be mini games to actually never even achieve the perk activation in a row, though his passive abilities are very useful regardless, two of them uh, revolve around invisibility modules. Another thing of note, the uh, invisibility module cooldown of 10% does not pass on to the Beholder Cabin, so it really is the Chameleon the Chameleon Mark II only. Um, so with all of those things said, Phobos has a lot of problems though he does have a lot of solutions at the same time. So after all that said, where does Phobos exactly land on this tier list? Well, his active ability doesn't come in as often as you'd like. There can be multiple games in a row that you can be in that Phobos perk will never even trigger. It's kind of brutal. However, that said, his actual va uh, the actual value that you get from his passive abilities is more than you'd expect. Five kilometers an hour is five kilometers an hour, and that's something that isn't mimicked anywhere else. It can help you out with engines, it can help you out with closing distance if you're a melee player, it will help you out if you're a ranged player who likes to keep distance, it will help you out. Um, that five kilometers an hour is remarkable, and cloaking modules are the most powerful modules in the game, and so anything that boosts them, especially considering that the boosts that Phobos provides are the same boosts provided by fusing, your uh, chameleons, that actually gets uh, some pretty strong passive values. So we're going to put him right there. Next up is Aditlan. Aditlan has a, a bit active ability that has four charges. You gain one charge from hitting the same enemy with two rockets from the same volley, or four charges instantaneously charging the perk if you can strike two enemies at the exact same time. Perk says that on the next shot that is fired after you achieve activation of the perk for four seconds, at it lands or you do 10% more blast damage and 33% more blast radius. At it lands passive abilities are 5% more fire puddle radius, 15% more ammunition, and 10% rocket fire rate per rocket volley. So this means that if you have like the cricket and fires five rockets, each of those individual rockets within that volley will come out 10% faster. Adelan is an interesting uh, co-driver indeed as she has multiple ways to activate her perk, not just uh, landing multiple rockets in the same volley, but of course hitting multiple enemies simultaneously uh, with blast damage. They don't. This does not have to be rocket damage, it has to be blast damage. This is very interesting. So if you attempt to charge the perk one charge at a time. This can take a good long time, but you can do it with rockets, but only rockets. Um, retchers do not count. Threshers do not count. Rapid fire grenade launchers do not count. Uh, artillery such as the Mandrake does not appear to count. Artillery such as the Heather does not seem to count. So when it says uh, multiple hits with the same rocket volley, they specifically mean rockets. However, hitting enemies simultaneously with blast damage does apply to each and every single blast weapon in the game. This includes Retchers, this does include the Heather, and so on and so forth. Once active, <clears throat> that 33% additional blast radius is noticeable. The 10% blast damage is not as noticeable, because again, there are other bonuses from other co-drivers on this list that actually give you far more than 10% damage. You can get 20% damage, you can get 28% damage, and so on and so forth. Beyond that, Aditlan's passive perks have almost no synergy with themselves. Rocket fire rate and fire puddle radius are mutually exclusive. Ammunition does work towards both, which is good, but combine that with the fact that you're looking, there's no other real co-driver that buffs fire weapons in this game. Fire weapons have more or less been removed from the previous version of the co-driver pass, and that's with all these universal damage uh, provisions from, let's say, 
Billy, J, Yuki, R-Type, and so on and so forth. So because of the fact that universal damage has replaced specific fire damage, Adatlan's 5% puddle radius isn't really that big of a boon. Yes, there is a slight synergy between Adatlan using, let's say, Mandrakes, because you get the fire puddle radius, the ammunition, as well as the potential to trigger Adatlan's perk. But in reality, these abilities don't synergize overly well with each other, and that's one weapon out of, again, 160 plus at this point. All that said, Adatlan is probably one of the weakest co-drivers in Crossout currently. It's sad to say, but her active ability is difficult to pull off, though you can pull it off more often than Phobos, because of the fact that all you need is multiple enemies and blast and the will to get it done. But <clears throat> her passive abilities are not that strong. Um, they're just not that strong. They don't work well together. And unfortunately, that puts her in a bit of a pickle. So this is basically where I put Adatlan on. Next up on the tier list, we have Falcon, the quintessential hover co-driver. Falcon has a perk that has six charges. You gain three seconds per charge while looking at an enemy within radar or friendly radar range that is being provided to you via our radio. Uh, taking damage from any source will reset these charges to zero. Even if the perk is currently active, it will turn it off. And the perk's effect is it will increase damage that you deal to the target that is highlighted by the perk uh, by 15%. And at the same, uh, exact same time, all explosives on that build will be highlighted to you as they would if you were looking through a neutrino scope. Falcon's passive perks are minus 15% weapon spread during movement, which is very, very good for hovers, 10% additional radar range, and 10% more engine power, something that many hover players would sell their mothers for. Due to the wording of Falcon's active perk, many people think that the bonus damage that you deal is only to high explosives because it says that it highlights the explosives, etc, etc, and the way that it's phrased is interesting. But after testing, absolutely all damage dealt to enemies that are targeted by this perk is increased by 15%, not just to high explosives, it just also highlights the explosives. One thing of note, however, uh, Falcon's perk is interesting when it comes to perk frequency. Because of the fact that it's as easy to activate as merely looking at your opponent, you'd assume that it would be always on. But the thing is, swapping targets is a very large problem with Falcon. This is in stark contrast to, say, Jay. Jay, it doesn't matter who you shoot. If you shoot someone and then continuously get hits, it doesn't matter who you hit, get hits upon, your damage bonus is going to stack. Falcon is not the same way. Falcon will give you a 15% damage bonus against the one person you see for six seconds. But if you see someone else or if that person takes cover, you can't at will change targets to that new person unless you take damage, which is something that is out of your control. When combined with his perks, the movement spread, uh, sorry, weapon spread while moving, as well as the radar range, which you need to, you know, prevent yourself from being ganked by some invisible dog, as well as 10% engine power. You can see why Falcon is just a phenomenal co-driver for hovers. Uh, he has uses in other builds as well, uh, especially those who want a generic damage boost over distance. Uh, his perk is very easy to activate over any distance. Unlike other uh, on this list, such as Jay, who requires 80 meters, you have uh, Billy, who requires 30 meters uh, distance plus. You have Yuki, who requires 0 to 35 meters. You have R-Type, which requires you, you... Ignore all of those things. You don't need distance to your opponent. Also, Phobos requires within 30 meters. Uh, you don't need distance to your opponent to enable Falcon's 15% damage anywhere. As long as you can see your opponent, Falcon's perk and accurate. So with all that said, where does Falcon land on this list? Well, put simply, his passive abilities are absolutely top-notch. They're all the way to the top of the top. They all synergize extremely well with each other. If you're trying to make a hover better, his perks are just absolutely magnificent. If you're trying to make any general build better, his perks are, in general, pretty dang good. And then, of course, his active perk is very easy to achieve simply because by looking at your opponents it activates. Pretty crazy stuff, though. The problem is it's not active all the time. It's not active as often as you'd like. It can be difficult to swap between opponents, and so on and so forth. But Falcon is a very strong co-driver with a very, very versatile perk. So, that's where he'd go on the list.
Last up on the list, we have Grizzly. Grizzly's perk has 30 charges, and you gain 10 charges when hit, with a 1 second delay per enemy that hits you. Though, if multiple enemies hit you, they can automatically be set to full. Charges degrade over time as you do not take damage, and the effect is 30% cross-out damage resistance for 4 seconds after the perk activates. Grizzly's passive abilities are 3% more mass limit, 5% more cabin hit points, and power penalty of your moving parts reduced by 10%. Ultimately, there's very little to say about this co-driver. He is unbelievably oppressive uh, in Crossout today. Um, his perk frequency is top-notch. Even though it is not continuous, it damn near almost could be because of the fact that there is no delay after your perk ends between gaining new stacks for the next perk, and if you're under attack by two to three more enemies, that means it's, it will instantaneously be restacked up to 30 charges, which will give you your four seconds or so of 30% crossout damage resistance. Um, the passive abilities of Grizzly synergize extraordinarily well with this 30% damage resistance as 5% more cabin hit points plays into that. 3% more mass limit means that you'll have more weight on your build, which means that you'll have more hit points in general because you'll be able to put more things onto your build. This is the, I would say, acquiescence of Gaijin to bring over what remains of Master Jack from the previous set of co-drivers, as <clears throat> unfortunately you require 16,500 plus mass on your build in order to get the 500 kilograms of weight back, but this is the only co-driver that provides additional weight beyond the current maximum of your Grizzly's perk and passives are unique in Crossout insofar as that it is the only perk in the entire game that is not remotely under any circumstances controlled by you the player. You the player do not control Grizzly's perk, instead it activates automatically um, whenever you need it, which is amazing. If you need it, it will be there because it will turn on because it, you'll need it. It's pretty crazy. Um, the, combine that with the fact that there's next to no cooldown between uh, charges gained, the fact that the more enemies that attack you, the faster that you get this perk. It just extends your lifespan. All of these co-drivers, every one of them increases your damage in some way, shape, or form. Grizzly is the only one who does the exact opposite and extends your time on the battlefield. Combined with the survivability buffs that have been recently coming across Crossout along with certain cabins that shall not, rename, uh, that shall not be named, you can get extraordinarily tanky chonkers builds nowadays, all thanks to Grizzly. Grizzly's perk his uh, active abilities, they all work together, and he's very basic. If you're a new player to Crossout, I could not suggest any co-driver other than Grizzly to start with. All that said, where, where would Grizzly place on this list? Well, I think we all absolutely know where Grizzly places. Grizzly is presently the strongest co-driver. With bar none, strongest co-driver in the game. His perk will be effective in every single game you play. It will always come up in each and every single game that you lose because they have to shoot you to death in order to achieve victory. It will come up in 99% of any games that you win. Um, his passives are of extraordinarily high value. Uh, additional mass means more hit points. More hit points is more hit points. Power penalty means that, again, you can have heavier movement parts and maintain decent acceleration. There is almost no build in the entire game that does not accept Grizzly into it and become better for it. In many instances against the contemporaries here, Grizzly actually will outperform them, uh, even at the things that they're supposed to be good at, simply because of the fact that if you're alive, you can deal damage, and if you're dead, you can't. Grizzly is a phenomenal co-driver and puts every other co-driver to shame. Everyone kind of already knows this. Anybody who uh, has played Crossout after the co-driver update probably had an inkling of knowing where Grizzly was going to go, but nevertheless, we had to put him there at the very end, just, you know, for consistency's sake. So, oh, there we are. There you have it. There is the co-driver tier list on this alignment chart, letting you know approximately when, where, how the co-drivers stack up against each other with their passives and their actives and how, you know, how they work, obviously. Each of these things are rated based on the weapons that you would use them. You're not going to use J with machine guns, and you're not going to use Billy with drones, and you're not going to use R-Type 52 with anything but drones, and so on and so forth. And of course, you have your shotgunners, Yuki and Phobos. 
and blast weapons at it land, etc., etc. And of course, you've got your snipers, Jay and Falcon, competing against each other. But Grizzly standing above all others, looking down from his throne. But the overall idea is, this is how I believe they would rank and stack up. And if you're a new player, I hope this helps you out. And if you're a returning player or old player, hope that you enjoyed this tier list. Well, if you like these tier lists and so on and so forth, like, subscribe, you know I have to beg, plead, etc. If you disagree, comments below. If you agree, comments below. If you want more tier lists, comments below. I am not going to do a damn parts tier list. I'm not doing it! Not doing it! Someone's going to leave a, 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 leave a message in these comments saying, we want a parts tier list. Do you have any idea how ridiculous that is? That's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Anyway, peace.